Before we start this episode, we would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country we live and work on, which for Jenna is the Darug and Gundungurra peoples, and for me is the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples. Sovereignty was never ceded, and this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Welcome to Somebody You Love, or The Sale of Two Titties. I'm Jenna Love. And I'm Holly Hart. And we're experts in disappointing our parents, breaching community guidelines and banging the people who vote against our rights. So we have another episode of Just the Tips, So You Want to Be an Independent Escort. Uh, And it's important for us to say again that the sex industry is really broad and we can only talk specifically about being an independent full service sex worker because both of us um, have the most experience in that particular area. Um, We've both only worked in so-called Australia as well. So our information is really only relevant for this country um, because the industry varies so much across different legal jurisdictions and cultural environments. I mean, it varies across so-called Australia as well, but there's a fair few things in common at least. Um, And please don't take these episodes as like an endorsement for the industry or us saying, um, please come and be independent escorts. Um, Something I always say is like, you know, this is the best job in the world for me, but I don't think it's a great job for that many people. Like I think it takes a really specific kind of person. Um, And Holly and I are definitely in that category, but it's not suitable for everyone. So you've got to make up your own mind about that. But we do get a lot of requests for information so we can share what our experiences have been. And hopefully that will be of use to you. So in part two, we talked about advertising, screening clients and securing bookings. Today, we are going to talk about the actual booking itself. How do we stay on time to start with? So there's different strategies out there. I, for one, cannot possibly fathom doing a booking without my watch. I don't know how people do them. I don't know how people do life without watches. There's a lot of people out there (laughs) just like raw dogging their wrists without a watch. Like I don't, I don't know how they're coping, but uh, like to the point where one time I went on tour and accidentally left my watch at home and annoyingly because I have a smartwatch, it was charging. Uh, So when I got to the airport, I spent 150 bucks buying a watch because I was like, I cannot do a tour without my watch. So that's how I stay on time. I just look at the time on my wrist. (laughs) Yeah. That's a, it's a good one. (laughs) I think a lot of workers who, uh, have become private workers used to be parlor workers, not blanket, but often, you know, we've sort of done the little, the little pathway that way. Um, and so, um, in the brothel environment, you have a timer set and somebody will ring a buzzer or knock on the door um, at five minutes to the end of the allocated time. That is not how it worked in either of the brothels I worked in. Oh, oh, okay. Forgive me. Go on. What, tell me how. They would yours. just start buzzing if you went over time. So it wasn't very helpful in terms of time management. Wow. But, okay. Yeah, yeah. But well, yeah, sometimes there is a strategy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I've always thought setting a timer is is fine. I know some sex workers find it a little bit um, like clinical or whatever to have a, an alarm go off at the end of the booking. But I think, hey, it's it's a booking. Like you've said many times on this show, there's no point in pretending that's not what this is. Um, if we have other things to do, um, then, yeah, it's important to keep track. I don't tend to set one anymore simply because – Um, I think that having done this work for a long time, my internal clock is pretty good. I have a reasonably good sense of where we're at in an hour or two hours. Um, But every now and then I'll have a a little glance over at my phone or um, just check where we're at. Um, And I'm also very fortunate because I'm not often touring. So um, keeping things to the minute is not as important for me. I'm happy if we run a little tiny bit over time. That's not a big deal. Um, yeah, you definitely do develop a sense of how long half hour is, how long an hour is, how long an yes. hour and a half is. Like you you do um, get better at that over time for sure. Um, I always yeah, make definitely. sure like my in-call has a clock on the wall. Unfortunately, that's often not the case when touring. Like places just don't have clocks anymore. I don't know what's yes. going on. I know everyone loves to use their phone. <laughs> But I've had a number of clients compliment me on having the clock on my wall because then it means they're easily able to um, 
keep an eye on the time as well. So like the people who want to take some responsibility for it, especially because often they don't want to bring a smartwatch or a phone into the booking space um, because people are concerned yeah. about recording potential, blah, blah, blah. So having, if you can, if if you have control over your space, having a clock that's visible to both of you, I think is really great because it, it yeah, it means both of you can take some shared responsibility for the timing. I think um, I'm hesitant to have a clock in the room because I feel like uh, it adds some pressure. I feel like ah. often you have clients who are having a really hard time getting where they need to or mm. getting over the line or whatever, um, or they're they just get really conscious of time passing mm. and they want to make the most of it or they um uh whatever it just it just gets them back um yeah in their own head instead of being in the moment they can keep looking over and, and that's stressing yeah. them out i have so seen that that's happen sort of why i don't yeah. do it i have seen like when we're just hanging out chatting at the end i've seen their eyes just keep darting yeah. to the clock and i'm like it's fine we're just chatting <laughs> yes. like it's all good i know what time it is don't stress so uh, i i see your point for sure yeah yeah um, so yeah, aside from us setting timers and keeping track of time for those bookings, which obviously, as we said, is, is more important, I suppose, if you're in a position like you are when um, you are sharing the household with another human being who, you know, will come home at some yes. point. So there's, you know, need more to use of the a, bathroom. Yeah, no, yeah. urgency to, to wrap things up exactly. Or um, when you're on tour, but um, yeah, these are, these are important things for, for a variety of reasons is keeping things on time. The other factor of, of staying on time is how to uh, signal to a client that it is time to move on. Mm. Um, and there are a range of things for that. I think, uh, like you said, some a lot of clients are really super aware mm-hmm. and they're like, oh, I think it's coming to, yeah. oh, well, should I, you know, and that's that's really sweet. Um, and I think we've discussed on the show before that um, if, if I'm giving you the cues, that's that's giving you the cues. If I'm wrapped around you, that means you're, you can relax a little yeah. bit. So, I mean, unless um, you I want think, to leave. I think that is If you do want to go, uh, yeah. then that is oh, your right. Oh, uh, fine. <laughs> You have to pay extra, but you can leave. Um, yeah, I think um, I think a lot of sex workers are pretty clear in their cues, but mm. what are those cues? Mm. How do we signal to a client um, aside from, all right, time's up, get mm. out, mm. Um, which I do say often, yep. playfully. But yeah, I yeah, think that's, um, that's one of my I often will say, skills. okay, I'm so sorry, I'm going to have to kick you out. And it's just like I think yep. sometimes just being upfront about that, you don't have to say it in a mean way, you, you know, I think that. That definitely mm. sometimes happens. And that often happens to me when I'm having a great gas bag and I'm really enjoying chatting yes. to the client. And then I'm like, okay, yes. fuck, I'm sorry. I ne- you need to go. <laughs> like it's actually more of a criticism <laughs> of me, you know. Very relatable, yeah. You know, I think there's lots of subtle clues. And, that yeah, the problem is, as we've said on other episodes of this show, is that not everyone gets the more subtle cues. So, yeah, sometimes you do just need yes. to say, okay, it's time to go. But, um you know, it's always worth trying the more subtle options if, yeah, you, if think, you're comfortable doing that. I think one thing is like standing up, like just getting off the bed and standing up mm-hmm. because that's something we all, like you said, humans, we copy each other. Like it's a shift in the energy. I mean, I saw this at a show last night and I freaking hate it. Like I don't know who told audiences they could stand up, but you know, one person stands <laughs> and then everyone's like, oh, guess we're standing. And then everyone fucking stands up. So that's a that's a good one. Literally just standing up. Mm-hmm. If they're really not getting the hint, um, you can start cleaning, start tidying up. Um, you know, I know workers who just start making themselves a cup of tea, like they just kind of move on with their business, start getting dressed and just kind of go on with their day, <laughs> which is one option. Yep, exactly. Another way I like to cue is saying um, thank you for your time. You know, I've had a lovely time with you today Mm -hmm. Um, or asking, would you like a shower before you leave? Um, Those are all indications that we're starting to move. Um, Look, if you get to the point where that that sex worker has – stripped the bed and um, showered and mm. taken their makeup yeah, off then and you is have making a tea. Overstay. You need to start thinking about 100%. this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot. That's the main one I do. Like all my regulars I reckon would know that when I say, did you want to grab a yeah. shower? That means, okay, the booking's over. <laughs> and if they say no, yeah. I go, okay, well then we can squeeze in a couple more cuddles. Um, but because I've usually squirted yeah. all over them nine times out of ten, they – they're like, yes, I need to wash this off me before I leave. Um, so that's, yeah, that's the big one for me is I just say, did you want to grab a shower? And they know what that means. Um, yep. But, yeah, you're so right. If you're having to resort to all these other things, then 
It's not you, it's them. (laughs) And I do think if it gets to the point where somebody is running really, really behind and you just need to get moving, um, I know there's so much... um, so much pressure in this job to be polite and to yeah. be amenable and stuff. Yeah. But it's, there is absolutely no harm in saying to somebody, um, okay, I actually have somebody arriving soon or I have to be in a, at an appointment or whatever it mm. is very shortly. Um, I really need you to grab, or do you want to put your jacket on outside or do you want to, whatever mm. it is, um, you know, or do you, do you want to sort that stuff out? Let people know that you have something else happening and that you need to get moving. That's You, you are so within your rights to really politely say, um, you know, I've had a really great time and I can see that you, you're trying to get that organized, but I, I really really have to get you moving yeah it's okay yeah we're, we're humans yeah. um and yeah it's you can set boundaries i was going to share the tip that i used to use for keeping time um when i worked in a massage parlor which was the old um Ooh. have a playlist for each length of time that you might be booked for ah, so i had a yeah, playlist yeah. for 30 minute bookings one for 45 one for an hour one for an hour and a half i think because that they were mostly shorter bookings genius um yeah, and the ends of those pod they always ended with the same three songs. So they were just songs that I liked. My playlist for work is always just shit I want to listen to because I'm the one that has to listen to it again and again. Yes. And so, yeah, when it would get to a certain song, I knew that was the point because like, this was massage with a happy ending. So when it got to that song, it would yeah. be like, okay, it's time for the happy ending. <laughs> then, you know, the next song would be, okay, um, the person needs to be up now and heading towards the shower. And when the final song started, it was like, okay, we need to be getting dressed and, and getting out of here. And that's a way to do it. Fantastic that's like a little idea. bit more subtle, you know. Um, you know exactly what's going on and how long you have, but they may not notice. Obviously, if you have regulars, they might start being like, wow, it's the same song every fucking time. But, um, yeah, so that that's one strategy if you're looking for, you know, a way to be a bit more subtle about it. I think it's Spotify that has like a sleep alarm on it where you can set up, oh, you, you can set up the music to turn off, to like fade out after – 30 minutes, 45 an hour. There's a few settings. So it wouldn't work for longer bookings, but that would be another option that you press play on the playlist at the start of the booking. Um, and then the music will fade out when it's end, which is again, one of, or you could set it to, you know, fade out maybe five minutes before the end time. Um, Cause that's another example of something where there's an energy shift and even cause your music's normally kind of mm. down low. Um, they may not even really notice, but you just feel something has changed like and you'll be aware of it so you'll be like yeah cool okay i need to get them in the shower but also yeah just a change in the vibe Mm, i think that's a really good idea i actually really want to look into that that's Mm. it's so Mm. subtle yeah yeah (laughs) i have thought how funny because i have all smart lights and whatever in my house and i thought how funny it would be if i just like set it up so that at like the time like the booking, like or maybe five minutes over, like if they're overstaying, that all the lights just go like 100% really bright um, <laughs> and the music cuts <laughs> off, like at the nightclub at the end of the night, like just is like, right, yes. it's fucking over. Oh. I just thought that would be quite funny. Yeah, yeah. I've not done that. All right, so Holly, should we talk about how you um, like set up the booking itself? How do you run the booking? How, what, what, what do you, how do you do that? I really love brothel methods. Um, I don't really stick to them now, but I think for newbies, they're really great. Um, And obviously there are going to be plenty of people who are just starting out in the industry who have not worked in brothels. Um, So generally the the sort of method is uh, the client comes in, you take your payment, you do a quick health check, you chuck them in the shower, uh, they come to the room, you have a chat, maybe you do a massage. I generally don't offer massage because I am so spoiled and I think there's a whole thing about it. Look, if you want to know about it, ask me when you book me next and I'll give you my rant <laughs> about why I don't really offer massage much. I should. I don't hate it. It just sort of felt no. like servitude for, I me don't. for a while. I felt like like – no, well, I feel like I used to do it in the brothel. Like I would always mm, do a massage and then we'd done. move on to the sex and then after we'd have a chat. Mm, yeah, right. No. I just sort of always felt like, um, no, we're booking and we're having a shared intimate time yeah. together. I felt like that feeling, it was like I'm serving you in it. And, um, yeah, right. It just, yeah, no, but I've always thought I that would like be massaging really odd people. to start massaging. Like, no. Sometimes people want to do it to me and I accept that. I love that. Oh, but I'm not God, giving you a massage. Go to a massage, massage therapist. I'll probably fuck you up. <laughs> It's not a good idea. 
Anyway, that general plan is is pretty effective, I think, and I don't stick to that as a concrete thing anymore. But I think that that works. Um, I guess the main thing is make sure you get your money up front. Look, I think when I do like sort of health checks, I do it in a very different way now. I don't do it in a really obvious um, the way that I used to do it, but I don't think there's a problem with that mm. either. I don't think if if you want to stop mm-hmm. your client before you even begin yep. anything, I think that's actually smarter yep. to say, hey, I'm just going to do a quick health check and have a, a good look then. I think mm. that's, that's quite wise. Yeah, look, we are going to talk more about health checks, but I, we in will. private work, generally – do it after the shower um, because I find that transition smoother. It feels more natural, blah, blah, blah. But that being yeah. said, gen- the the kind of more official advice is that, you know, showering can remove um, evidence of potential infection. So doing it before the shower mm-hmm. is, you know, probably better practice. Yeah. And then um, I think, yeah, you always – want to try and get your client in the shower. I am quite cruisy about it because I have a lot of clients that live quite close to me and I know they've had a shower before they've turned up. And I and also you don't have a sense of smell. I don't have a sense of smell. So Makes I'm not a, a big stress, difference. But uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. And a lot of my clients um, – uh, I know quite well now and I I'm uh, I guess my point is that I trust that they have you know <sighs> what am I trying to say I guess I'm trying to say that um, especially when you're newer to the job um, I feel like a lot of people say they've showered when mm-hmm. they haven't and that is really mm-hmm. annoying so I feel like just routinely getting people in the shower is it saves you a whole lot of checking and back and forth or rude shocks when you do get the clothes off and you go oh my goodness yeah. you have not washed yourself in a yeah. while um, and then having to awkwardly say can you please go and clean mm-hmm. this um mm-hmm. So yeah, get them straight in the shower and then do the other things in terms of how to run a booking. Um, as we've just discussed, you can do all your timing to, to certain, um, like a little schedule if you like, then, then yeah. Um, whether or not they want to shower when they leave, I do not care if you want to leave with me all over you do it. If you want to shower, that's fine. Um, yeah, that's, that's, uh, and I think, yeah, just making sure that you've got, um, all of your supplies. I think as a sex worker, um, that was one of the most daunting things for me about going private was what stuff do I need? Um, and do I have that stuff? Uh, as we've discussed before, going to the orgs is a really good way to get across that sort of thing. Um, but obviously the most important things are prophylactic, um, or barrier method protection. So things like condoms, dams, um, some lubricant, um, I think baby wipes is an essential for cleaning some things up in that situation. Um, you might want to have a toy or two, um, maybe some, some hand sanitizer and disinfectant, things like that um, are important in terms of your supplies for, for setting mm. up um, and, and doing sex work. Yeah. From what I read on Reddit, it seems like the showering thing is very different in other countries. Um, but I think it's important for people mm. to know that, there's always exceptions, but the standard expectation with um, a sex work, a booking with a sex worker in Australia is that you shower at the beginning of the booking. Is it the client? Sorry, showers at the beginning of mm-hmm. the booking. Um, and probably they've got the option of doing it at the end. I mean, that's kind of up to them. They don't have yeah. to, but um, generally a shower at the beginning and at the end, and they are included in the time. Yes. So if they mm-hmm. want to take 15 minutes in the shower, that's fine. But that comes off their time, you know, that, it, yeah, the time doesn't start after they get out of the shower. You will have clients that try to convince you mm-hmm. that's how so-and-so does it and maybe so-and-so does do it that way, but that is not the industry standard. But then Good point. the problem with that is then you get people who are super quick in the shower because they they don't want to waste their time and then they're not actually cleaning themselves properly and you're like, well, you actually have wasted your time because you're going to have to go back in and do another shower now because mm-hmm. you've actually not even showered. You've not used the fucking soap in terms of um yeah so i agree that it's they come in you i mean people have euphemisms some people say oh do you have a gift for me blah blah, blah. i'll just be like oh have you got money because <laughs> i'm just not really here for euphemisms you got money yeah so they come in <laughs> you grab the money and then you say did you want to have a shower um you could just say okay time for a shower like there are you know subtleties in the way you say it that could make it more I always ask if they want one um which has led to people being like oh no I'm good you know I showered before I left home and I'm like oh but you left you live two hours away like you've been sitting in the car for two like what the fuck it's (laughs) summer in Australia babes so (laughs) you know maybe yeah asking is maybe not the best advice but I've I struggle with 
you know, being firm about things like that. But then in terms of, so when they come out of the shower, then in terms of what do you do, there are some workers who have like a routine essentially. So they will do like, they, you know, go down to look at the genitals and stuff, do a health check. Then they might start with a blow job. Then they like to move into Mm -hmm. missionary and then cowgirl, whatever. Like, you know, people have like a certain kind of way they like to do things. I generally, and I think Holly's the same, have zero plan. Um, really like it it depends very especially with independent work like I think that routine is more common in a massage or a brothel setting but with independent work it really varies on the client because you will get some that are like not ready to do sexual stuff straight away Um, and on that note like I have had plenty that want to stay clothed for longer and so then the shower actually Mm -hmm. has to happen further into so that can you know can change things so you've kind of got to suss out what their vibe is yeah, they may or they may not want to take their clothes off at all. That also even happens sometimes. So, you know, there's just like way more factors and point. you do kind of have to be a little bit prepared. You know, you've got to do what, what, what you're comfortable with, but I do think be a little bit prepared to somewhat improvise and go with what the client's needs are to an extent. Yeah, I think that's a really, really good point uh, that I definitely didn't cover there is that, yeah, there's so much more variety in private work. I think particularly on longer bookings and with really mm. shy clients that, yeah, you you do sometimes need to ease into that. And um, I can you can tell when you get them in the room that you it's not as easy just to go, all right, go get your kid yeah. off, get naked, yeah. let me look at your yeah. genitals. They sort of like, wow, can we just yeah. really ease yeah. into it? And, um, yeah, so that yeah, flexibility right. Especially is really longer important. bookings. Yeah, I had one because so my at mm. home, when you open the door – as a client, you're a meter away from the bed, right? Like you, you walk into the in call mm. room. So, yeah. and all, and I'm not having clients wander through my whole house because I'm lucky enough that I don't, they don't <laughs> have to. So they just, the whole booking happens in the bedroom. And that's fine for mm. me. Like, I don't, like, we can just sit and cuddle. We can do, you can do all sorts of things on a bed. Like, beds are not just for sex. But I have noticed that some clients think that beds are just for sex. Um, so the other day I was touring. Mm. And so there was a lounge room and stuff. And I immediately like took the client and it was only an hour booking. So that's not a super long time. I walked into the bedroom and I sat on the edge of the bed and I was like, hey, it was my first time seeing them. And um, they were like, I think quite spun out that I sat on the bed. They were like, oh, c- can we just, can we go oh. sit in the lounge room for a little bit? I was like, yeah, of course, you know. Oh, wow. So then we went and sat down. They were like, yeah, okay. I'm just very nervous. Like I'm not that ready to. And I was like, well, I didn't start sucking you did I (laughs) like but (laughs) I think for some clients like even just being on the bed can be like intense for them and obviously we're so used to it like I was like oh shit I did not realize that was moving fast but for this particular person it was moving fast so yeah anyway yeah as we said it's a little bit different and we definitely can't tell you how to run the booking except giving you the knowledge that it is your booking to run you know and so it's this always this balancing act of customer service where you want your customer to have a good time, obviously, because you'd like them to re- – well, not you don't always want them to return, but, you know, most of them you'd like them to return. <laughs> um, but at the same time, very personal service, It's your own boundaries are important and your own ability to continue doing this job is important. So you're balancing both of those things all the time. How about setting up the bed, the linen? I know that you have some particular needs. Yes, I have some needs. Um, needs. Yeah, so for me, this is huge. Like I get a little bit envious sometimes thinking about workers that can turn up to a booking with like a handbag because I I mean I just couldn't ever do that. Like I turn up with a duffel bag and I feel like that's not like the sexy hooker look, but it's what I have to do because, yeah, as I've said a million times on the show, I'm a squirter, I squirt heaps um, and I'm not in the interest of going through a new mattress every night. So I put down either a vinyl rubber sheet and then put another sheet on top and then towels on top, or I use like a, a splash blanket or a liberator or something. So there's always specific stuff for that, which is, yeah, just necessary for me. Literally, like you can't take me anywhere. I've just, it's a whole <laughs> ordeal. Um, so I don't know, like I feel like there are standard ways that other workers handle their like bedding and stuff and I I don't know how other people do it yeah I think there's a lot of variety 
Uh, I think pretty common is uh, like a just no like doona or anything, but just like a fitted mm. sheet and or a coverlet. Um, and mm. then with towels or drop sheets on top or a like combination of towels and drop sheets um, to allow for like easy changing, um, especially mm. on tour or like, you know, particularly like when it's I worked in a volume. hotel, you'd keep the, um, yeah. yeah, the bottom bedding. If it stays clean, it's, it's okay for, for a couple of bookings in that day. Mm. And um, yeah, you just swap out that top layer. Um, but yeah. definitely I think having a, a waterproof mattress protector is really important and you can get them super affordably from places mm. like Kmart and Target and stuff. And I think that's a really good investment. Um, or in your case, you've got, um, you've got, uh, what do you call it? Pillow protector. Like, um, you know. Um, yeah. I have them on yeah. my pillows as well. Yeah. Which is actually Just a because great idea. dudes kept being like, sit on my face. And I was like, well, <laughs> your face is on a pillow. <laughs> so... Yeah. Yeah, I, I should yeah. invest in in the same soon as well. Just it just adds to that extra layer of um, protection and hygiene for things. Uh, makes it all a little bit easier to clean. But yeah, there's yeah, a because even of... if you're not squirting, there is probably bodily fluids of some kind <laughs> exactly. that are going to happen. So yeah, yeah. Um, so I think uh, yeah, it, there is so much variety. It's what you find works best for you, and particularly in your needs with um, whether you're producing a whole lot of bodily fluids or your service mm. tends to be one that's more um, using oils or certain kinds of lubes yes. or whatever. Um, I <clears throat> got a lot of drop sheets actually in the in the old days from Facebook Marketplace. People just getting rid of like sheets. People would just have like yeah. ten bucks for a huge bag, yep. of, um, and yep. they're you know nice just old mm. sheets and they work mm. great and they look cute and um super cheap uh or yeah i've gotten um some from kmart and target again as well mm. um uh, you don't want to spend a whole lot because they may get stained with yeah again mm. bodily fluids but also oil and stuff can stain and certain kinds of lubes yeah that's um, silicon lube is my biggest nemesis when it comes yeah. to bedding like a yeah. lot of my sheets have little silicon lube stains yeah and i never know like Unless it's really bad, I don't tend to throw them out. Like I tend to use no. them because I know that it's clean, it's clean, you know, but I'm like, oh, it doesn't like if it, yeah, if it looks really bad, obviously I won't use it, but totally. I never know if clients would worry about that. Like sometimes I've gone, oh shit, sorry. There's like a lube stain there mm. and I don't know if they care. They probably mm. do, but I don't. Well, <laughs> so, there, you there you go. <laughs> yeah. Especially because if it's on my, yeah, on my fitted sheet, like my actual sheet, I sure. buy expensive ones rather than yeah, a drop sheet. Yeah, do you? So Ooh. I'm like, I'm not chucking that out. She's a fancy um, girl. Wow. Yeah. Well, not not fancy, but they're not from Kmart. Wow. Okay. High class Jenna. <laughs> uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's also a great idea to have um, all of your, you know, tools of the trade handy. You know, you want to them to be kind of easy to reach for like mm. I like to it's weird I don't do it at home but I do it on tour is have um condoms of all sizes on either bedside table oh. so that wherever I am I can easily reach for one and then I have a little tub of lube on either side as well but yeah I mean you set it up however you want but that's just a tip that it's handy to be able to reach for things kind of quickly and mm. easily so let's move on to a health check or an STI screen in my brothel days, we had a pretty standard way that everyone did those things. In fact, I think it's referenced in the Red Book, um, mm-hmm. which is a Scarlet yes. Alliance resource. I was definitely going to plug oh, the Red Book online. Can, <laughs> yes. Uh, back in my day, it wasn't even online. It was just a little Red no. Book that was falling apart that we had in the back of the brothel. And <laughs> uh, it was revered. It was a, like a little Bible. and um, But yeah, but we would all sort of teach each other how to do them. Generally, we would recommend that you do it with strong lighting. Um, Often we would have a little hand torch in the brothels because the lighting was dimmed in the rooms. And so we would just have this bright little torch. We could shine on someone's genitals, have a really good look. You're looking for lumps, rashes, irritation, uh, broken skin, just anything that doesn't look quite right. Um, also to give the penis, uh, if it is a penis, a bit of a squeeze from the base up to the tip, just a gentle squeeze, see if there's any discharge. Uh, you know, that clear, like pre-cum is fine. If you're looking for um, uh, anything that's a, an off color, uh, milky, um, I'm not going to go into more descriptions because this is a little bit mm-hmm. um, 
you might be eating while you're listening to this, um, and also for smells, if anything doesn't smell quite right down there. Uh, and that also needs to include the testes um, and, and just the general um, area. And it doesn't only have to be STIs that you're looking for. There are also yeah. other skin conditions and stuff that can be um, uh, transmittable, um, but there are also a lot of skin conditions that cannot. So um, it's yeah. not about you're not diagnosing someone, you're not, um, you know, we're not stigmatizing them. We're just trying to keep your, your own body as safe as possible um, and able to keep working. Um, and, yeah, there, there is room for your own judgment there. Um, people will tell you sometimes that, oh, that thing is a, a this, I've had it for this mm, long and the yep. doctor said it's fine. Um, and sometimes I'm sure they're being honest and sometimes I, I think that they're not. And so it's it's um, it's a process. I will say that um, when I was, I think I've discussed this on the show before, when I was in a parlour, I saw so many instances of concerning things happening on people's genitals. Mm. Since I've been a private worker, it has been so small the ratio is is wild i i see very few instances now of of anything concerning in people's genital areas or anything that i think mm. um is is unusual um not just like concerning um and i don't know if that is a a socioeconomic thing or a shame thing maybe or a mm. i'm just going to mm. take my chances at the brothel because maybe they won't notice or um i don't know what what where that's from but definitely i saw it a lot mm. more in my parlor days um and yes yeah, sorry I've, just actually never had a client fail a health check i've never seen any of the symptoms in even in parlor work no <gasps> but i didn't do i didn't work very long in parlors but no never blown away but yeah. also i was not taught how to do it at a brothel mm. i was not we didn't have lights which wow. i know like a torch is quite standard for a lot, especially because brothels often have quite low lighting yeah but the two places i worked there was no i wasn't told about a torch i didn't see like I don't know anything about torches um, and I was not yeah. told how to do it. Yeah, I had to find the information myself. So, yeah, redbook.scarletalliance.org.au is a phenomenal resource for all it workers. Um, so there is a page on there that's like how to perform an STI check. Mm -hmm. But there's also there's a bunch of other stuff. There's images so you can have a look at what things look like it's a really good idea to get familiar with the common things um, that are not transmissible so like you know a common one yes. is the pearly penile papules right yeah which is where um it's so it's so not uncommon um for people with penises to have these like little dots around mm. like the base of the head if that makes sense the base of the head the yeah know, whatever it's a very common one um but when you see it for the first time a lot of people are like oh that looks like something's wrong and it it's not at all um you want to be looking as well as their genitals, whatever gender they are and whatever genitals they have. You also want to be looking like around the mouth or anywhere where you're going to be coming into contact with them. Correct. It's important to know that a health check absolutely does not tell you whether somebody has an STI or not. And it is no guarantee that they don't have one in particular. Like if somebody, if you see genital warts then chances are they probably have genital warts yeah. right but if you don't see genital warts that does not mean that they don't have hpv mm -hmm. at all it absolutely does not mean that you know most stis are asymptomatic or at least don't show like external physical symptoms so just keep in mind that the health check is just one thing in your toolkit it's worth doing but it's not you know, you also need to obviously be having regular testing, using yes. prophylactics, using barrier protection, etc. As Holly mentioned, you know, it's not just STIs that you're looking for. I think a big one for me, like the, as I said, I've never had someone fail a health check, but what I have seen is broken skin. And so that is an issue because then there's an entry into the bloodstream. So the broken skin doesn't say to me, oh, you've, you might have an STI. What it says is, if one of us does, there's a higher risk of transmission now because your blood is coming into contact with me or is, has the potential to come into contact with me. So something like that, depending on where it is and whatever, one solution um, is to chuck a Band-Aid on it. Just say, oh, I'm just going to cover yes. that up so there's no risk to either of us, you know, and then that you yeah, absolutely you proceed with the service. It's all good. The same with like a lot of these things, just because somebody does show signs of an STI or you are a bit concerned about it, it doesn't mean that you can't go ahead with things. Obviously, uh, you know, 
it's down to what you're comfortable with, but you can always offer alternate services. So like a hand job with a glove is an option, which can feel really nice actually with a glove and some lube. Like that's actually, Mm -hmm. you know, some people want that as a surface because it's hot or you can, you know, I've had plenty of clients who have, and that's why I say they've not failed a health check, but they've turned up and said to me, I've got a fucking cold sore on my mouth, so we can't kiss today. I mean, yeah. that's also, you know, so you can do the rest of the service. You just can't do kissing or they can't do oral on you, you know, so you can adapt the service. Um, but you can, you also are well within your right to say, I'm sorry, I can't proceed with seeing you today if um, anything's yeah concerning you. So I think that's most of in the booking covered. Probably not. I'm sure people ha- have other questions, but... We've done what we've done. Um, so now moving on, we had some questions on Instagram over the last little while about, I don't know, there's a more like after the booking slash just like existing as a sex worker questions. So one was what kind of mental self-care is necessary when you're starting sex work? This is a big question. It's a huge one. As soon as I saw it, mm. I went, oh, <laughs> I don't know how to. <laughs> Don't know oh. how to answer. Whoa, yeah, a bit, bit of an oof moment. Yeah, uh, yeah. mental self care. I, I mean, I have some things I can say though. But yeah, I think I think you you kick it off. You tell us okay. your insights. So yeah, this is a tough question, and we we don't know if we can answer it properly, but we'll just say some shit that comes to our heads. <laughs> I don't know what the point of me saying that was because that's it's the all we ever do. Podcast. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think something that's big when you're starting out is fighting the internalized whorephobia. Mm, yes. Because I know you and I have both gone through this. My friend Cece, who I've I've seen start in the industry a few years ago and, and go through it, um, went through this as well. Although she had the best kind of possible start, um, so she didn't go through it as badly. And we had this running joke where after every booking I would say to her, all right, do you still – is your soul still intact? Have you given – you know, did you sell so your soul cute. yet? Like is it all good? <laughs> And because there is this expectation that you should feel a certain way. And I think so many of us sex workers have done that. We've done our first booking or our first few bookings and we've gone, oh, I'm supposed to be broken now. Yeah, am I ruined? I'm I'm supposed to be missing part of who I am. I'm Mm -hmm. a, a ruined woman. I'm damaged. You're not actually feeling that way, but you think that you should feel that way. Um. So I think that's a really big one. I think building up resilience to that is really tough but if you if you're going into it going right I don't judge other women for doing this or other people for doing this job so I'm not going to judge myself for it I don't believe any of this misogynistic bullshit about somebody being ruined because they sold their labor like we do in society so I'm not going to do that to myself like I think if you can have some of that self-talk before going into it that's useful because it's so insidious and, I, you know, Holly and I to this day still catch ourselves having these internalized whorephobia moments. We still go, you know, I, I still have this stupid thing about because I'm not working like a quote unquote real job. I'm not doing like nine to five. And that means mm-hmm. I'm a bad person or something, which, you know, I say it out loud and it sounds fucking ridiculous, but yeah. it still gets in my head. Oh, so absolutely. I think that's, that's a big one. I look at other jobs or other uh things that I'd be interested in studying or doing, um, Mm. starting businesses or whatever. And I always have to check myself and go, but, but why? Because if you enjoy Mm. that thing, you can just do that as a thing. Why do you want to, you know, it's not just the hustle grind culture of monetizing everything, Mm. which Mm. is a whole other problem of, of society these days. But, um, it's also a part of like, do I feel the need to define myself as something other than a sex worker? Is that what this is coming from? Am I trying to, um, legitimize myself as a, um, member of society by having another Mm. career as well or something? And I, I don't think actively that's what's happening, but yeah, it's just another element of even to this day, people like us who are so out and we are so ingrained in what we do and so passionate about it but we still have these underlying things that we have to keep looking at and going oh shit is that coming from a place of feeling like um yeah sex work Mm. isn't okay or it isn't enough absolutely yeah Yeah. the question is about self-care yeah but i was going to talk about the absolutely invaluable nature of having people other people you can talk to and so if you're not able to be out with family and or friends 
um, then that is your peers. It's other people in the industry. So it's super, super, super important, particularly so if you're not out about your work, to find other people in the industry that you can talk to um, and that you can download and you can say, oh, I had this booking that was crappy. Or mo- it's more often is the booking was fine, but I feel ick. Something wasn't right about it. And you can yes. talk about that with your friends. And that's so valuable. Mm. Um, I mean, for me, obviously having Mr. Love has been phenomenal in terms of my mental well-being in this job. Like so many jobs, you come home from work and you talk to you vent to your spouse. Um or you say, oh, does this seem normal to you? Blah, blah, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but, yeah, as I said, not everyone has someone they can speak to openly about it. Um, but anyone, even if it's just a peer that you don't even know all that well, um, it, it, yeah, you, you need to have someone to talk to. Because yeah. it's, not, it's not even just because this job specifically. Like any, whatever you do, you need to have someone to talk to. So, But this job in particular attracts stigma, attracts discrimination, and some people don't talk to us very nicely, so you need to have an outlet. Yeah, I think having people that are um, maybe more open-minded or more understanding of mm. who you are or just of the industry, such as like peers being um, knowledgeable mm. about the industry, mm. they can understand um, that you can both enjoy the career that you've chosen and have a bad day at work, and that doesn't mean you need to leave that industry. Yeah. Um, so I think that's one of the things you face a lot when you are a sex worker is that, um, yeah, people, their, their internalized issues with it mean that the minute that you've had a bad day at work, and I'm not talking a traumatic, horrific day, but just a a day, Mm, mm. um, that they immediately go, well, you know, is this for you then? Did you, you know, maybe this is, maybe you should leave. Mm -hmm. Maybe you should go back and study this. You should do whatever. Yeah. Um, they take it as that opportunity to say what they've been wanting to say all along. Absolutely. You hear stories like that all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and would they say the same thing if you'd come home from an office job and said, oh, you know, mm. I, I had a bad day. Well, God, you should leave sales then. Mm. You should go and be like it. It just really mm. reflects on people's um, internal problems with the, the work itself. So being able to have somebody who um, either knows you well enough to know that you have made your decisions um, with proper insight and that you've um, made your mm. decision um, from a place of um, certainty and you know, uh, I think we've discussed before that that, that you know agency. yourself. Yeah, agency. Thank yeah. you. Yes, that's exactly what I was looking for. Um, or yeah, people who are within the industry who recognise that yeah, it's everyone has a bad day at work and that's normal. Mm. Um, is is really helpful. Um, I think in general, and I, I think a lot of this advice that we're giving right now actually could be um relevant for any job or any career that you choose. Mm. But I think just having a therapist is so important. And I've said it a million times on this show. And I think, yeah, especially when you are starting in sex work, it's helpful to talk about these sorts of things. It's really hard to find a good therapist who is um, across sex work and who isn't going to hear you say you had a bad day and, and, and guide you to leave mm. from a really, I think a really well-meaning place. I think a lot of people think that that they're helping when they give that sort of advice. Oh yeah, but they do. Yeah. You don't necessarily have to talk about um, the sex work itself with a therapist at first, if that's something you don't want to do, but having a regular professional that knows your mental health history and can help you pick up on signs when you might not be doing as well um, is, and help you to manage those emotions and to manage um, your mental health is really important. So whether or not that is something that you have disclosed um, or that you talk to them at all about for a little while is, is up to you. But I think having a mental health care provider um, or a mental health care team is so important at every stage in your life uh, or especially, yeah, when you're doing something that is a big move in your life. One more thing in terms of mental self-care, I would say going into it, Mm. is to try and have a stronger sense as possible of what your boundaries are. Um, and that includes physical, sexual stuff. It also includes emotional. Mm. Um, because what we're doing is coming into really intimate contact with a range of people. And, you know, in certain way, like w- one example is, which I think this would be similar with with carers, with people that work in hospitals, etc. We sometimes come across people who are in a really bad place and it's it can be heartbreaking and they can offload a lot of that onto us sometimes in a way that's that's not great but sometimes it just happens and sometimes you connect with somebody and they share and 
like it's, you have to be able to distance yourself. You know, you have to be able to, in that moment, hear them and be there for them. But I know myself that I, I find myself thinking about that person that night and, and it brings, it makes me sad, you know, and the way I deal with that is usually talking to Mr. Love or Holly about it and just kind of expressing it. And, um, that helps me a lot. Um, but there's that example of it, but then there's also, you know, we come across people with, that are not, not so innocent who have, you know, that will try to kind of love bomb and will, you know, all, all the same dynamics that you might come across in the dating scene can come up. Um, so, so having a real strong sense of what you will and won't accept, Mm. um, from your clients if possible, and it will change as you go and you'll discover new things and you'll go, Oh, okay. I thought I'd be fine with that, but I'm not fine with that. Um, but, but really doing a proper think about that, not just, am I okay with doing a blowjob with or without condoms, Sure. but what, what kind of behaviors, um, it's hard. It's, it's a hard one, but, but think about that beforehand and keep thinking about it as you go through. I think that's so important for your own self care. Um, and I think it also links quite well to another tip that we had or another question that people have asked us Mm. is how to build assertiveness as a worker. And my advice is pretty similar for that, which is to decide on your boundaries early and um, practice how you would assert them. And that, Mm. as you just discussed, can be so broad and so it's such vague advice, decide boundaries. Mm -hmm. Um, And (laughs) we've sort of talked before about this scale. And so in this scenario, I'm just talking about sexual acts but it could be Mm -hmm. for anything it could be um topics of discussion um i suppose it could be for um um, like emotional statements that you are comfortable with um but Mm. there's a scale or even like how long before a booking you require notice to take on the yeah no you're right like that is very true this this scale can apply to Mm. anything in your life but i think it's really effective within sex work and and you and i have had quite a few chats personally about it and it's quite um and when I say personally, I mean like off, off the podcast, um, but usually relating to work. Um, so there's sort of, I, I like to put it into about five categories for your, like a scale yeah. we've got, yeah. um, you, you, and this again, could be for activities. It could be for interactions, anything. First one is that you love this thing and you prefer it. And this is how you want things to be. Two is that you enjoy it and it's, it's nice. Three is that you are ambivalent. You don't hate it or love it. It's fine. You tolerate it. No worries. Uh, Number four is that you don't really enjoy this thing, but you can tolerate it for X extra money or for a short period. Or the fifth one, that you hate it and you absolutely never want to do it or or have that scenario. Can I add Um, to four or with the right person? Or with the right person, sure. Certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. Yeah, circumstantial for, for number four. So I think having an idea and sitting down even and thinking about certain acts and what categories they would be in um, can help or conversation topics or, as you said, uh, structures for how you like your booking um, really can help you to work out those boundaries rather than being in that position where somebody launches something at you and you don't know if you – do I hate this? Am I okay with this? Do I not really care? Can I take it for a little – like it's it really helps. And like you said, it's going to change all the time – But having a little bit of a sense of those things helps you to identify what are your absolute no's. And once you know those absolute no's, you can prepare yourself for how to assert that boundary and to say to people, oh, no, I I absolutely do not like you um, blowing air in my ear hole. Um, That is absolutely (laughs) off the limits for me. And then you can go, well, I really don't like people um, putting their fingers in between my toes but I can, ha- I can deal with it for five minutes or it's all right when he mm. does it for a little while. So after a mm-hmm. few minutes, um, what am I going to say when I've, I've hit the limit of how much I can accept of that? Um, oh, my toes are getting a little bit sensitive now, um, which is the truth. Mm. It's not about lying, but it's just about how you mm. feel comfortable framing those things because sometimes you can feel like, well, I did that in that booking and now I'm not going to do it here and will this person take offense yeah. and how do I say no? And we're all guilty yep. of it. I'm, I've said it before. I've, I've definitely... Um, uh, consented to things and then later on I'm like oh and I have to consciously think about okay how do I let that person know next time that I'm not that into that thing anymore or that um maybe this week I'm not up for that thing or whatever um yeah and 
So I don't yeah, think it can something... be the exact same scenario, yes, same yes. circumstances. It can be the same person, same day of the week, same time yeah. of day, same location. And for whatever reason on that day, you're not comfortable with it, but you were last week. Yeah. Um, and that's fine. But yes. it, it, it's how do you, um, how, how do you, you articulate it? that? What do you Exactly. You know? And um, I think definitely um, ascertaining as much as you can in advance of those hard no's and those soft no's um, and, and how you would say them sitting down and thinking to yourself uh, and you can em- envision the scenario, envision the client and, and how you would say it. And I think that's really, really helpful. And I, that's definitely how I think I um, build some assertiveness for myself. I would recommend uh, saying it out loud as well. Yeah, okay. In your yeah. home. When you're mm-hmm. on your own, thinking about it in your head is really valuable. Writing it down is valuable. Right. But the gap between those things and actually saying it, adding voice to it, yep. is a big gap. Mm-hmm. So I would, you're going to feel like a knob, but I would genuinely say wander around your hallway saying, oh, no, sorry, that's not something I offer. Or whatever yep. the phrase is, yep. like literally say it out loud so it becomes, it's like a script, it's like an actor rehearsing their lines. Mm-hmm. It becomes second nature so that when that person asks for that thing or whatever it is, it just, it's, that's the natural response. Yeah. yeah. Rather than you clamming up and going, fuck, I don't know how to deal with this situation. Mm-hmm. It's time for us to thank our gorgeous, stunning, beautiful, sexy patrons. They are our even more generous somebodies, the Ashley Stafford, the Rhiannon Rhodes, the Peaches Wild, Nomad, Adele, Andrew, Lachlan, Leslie, Sub London, Mr. E, NK, Scott C, Simon, Steve, Timmy, Wheezy, Luke, Frankie, is Lost in Thoughts, Cuddle Koala, Stanley Doolittle, insert witty comment here, you cheeky bugger with that name, Den, Damo, <laughs> Anne and Tom. And an extremely generous thank you to our extremely generous somebodies, Aaron, Andrew, Adam Smith, Pete, The Sienna Saint, Tim, David and Tom. Thank you so much for listening. Also, I don't know how we did not mention until now that this is episode 69. Yeah, the most overrated sexual position. Yeah, the worst. We literally considered making this whole episode dedicated to how lame 69 is. Yeah. I'd definitely um, say it's not the worst, but, but it's, it's overrated. No, it's not. No, It's a three yeah. on the scale. It's a three. Yeah. It's a yeah, three. it's a three. It's no, fine, I'm, I'm actually with I'm you on that. I'm totally ambivalent. Yeah. 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 We can do it, but I'm not going to get anything out of it. Well, yeah, I'm too busy focusing on the doing. For or the I'm most too busy part, but this is interesting. The giving, See, the getting. last week I was like, oh, should I climb on top? Like I went to initiate it mm. and my client was like, what? But you hate 69 because he'd listened to the show and he's great. Yeah. Um, and I was like, yeah, I do. But I feel like it in this moment. So yeah, sure. as long as you're cool with it, let's do it. You know? Yeah. So that's I've just it. Had boundaries fun boundaries yeah. change. Yeah. They do. They yeah. Do. yeah. But yeah. for the most part, pff, lame. Yeah, I go off for fuck's sake. So I've, I've got to yeah. have give you a mediocre blowjob or you give me head that I'm not yeah. able to focus on. So You're I, just going to half ass everything. Yeah. yeah. All right. Love you guys. <laughs> Catch you next time. See you next time. Bye. Please look out for us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Patreon. Our name everywhere is Somebody You Pod, as in podcast. Our Patreon starts at just $3 a month and you can get all of our episodes ad-free and a day early, plus bonus episodes, behind-the-scenes action, bloopers and more. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the voices of sex workers. And remember, somebody you love might just be a sex worker.